So now we're recording. Um, uh, a second thing is, and this is entirely voluntary, but if if some of you felt like turning on your video uh, on your video capability, it would help us who are presenting feel a little bit less like we're talking into the void. Um, up to you. If you don't have sufficient um, bandwidth, no no pressure. If you don't feel like it, no pressure. But that would be awesome. Um, uh, finally, as you can tell, we have sign language interpreters and we have computer transcription. If anybody's having difficulty with accessibility for this event, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, ask again that everybody everybody make sure you stay muted. But if anybody's having any difficulty with accessibility for this event, put something in the chat so that we can try to solve it. Okay, so um, I'm Margot Schlanger. I founded the Clearinghouse, the Civil Rights Litigation Clearinghouse about 15 years ago. And for that time, we've been making public uh, documents and information about large scale civil rights cases with um, a special focus, although not an exclusive focus on cases involving the, the criminal justice system, jails, prisons, policing, um, juvenile detention and the like. Um, and we feel very strongly that making those documents and information accessible to people is useful both for folks who run jails and prisons and also for people who advocate for those on the inside. Um, the white paper series that we started recently, the idea of it has been to actually do some of that work, to use the documents and the experience of litigation to use um, to use that experience to inform policy and to and to model how one might do that, and also to do something that we hope is useful as a policy intervention. So our first white paper um, is the one that's at issue today about deaf, hard of hearing, blind, and low vision folks behind bars. So what I'm assigned to do in this um, webinar is to show you the clearinghouse, show you where all this stuff is, and then get out of the way a little bit for, um, for Tessa and Amy to talk more about um, uh, the specifics, although I'll, I'll venture back into the conversation as well. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna share screens for, um, for those of you who, um, who are blind, I'm also going to share the URL of the pages that I'm going to. And actually um, I'm gonna ask Hannah, who's um, the, I put it in the chat already. Oh, great. I'm going to ask my um, some of the co-hosts to put in the chat the the URLs that we're using. So here we Hannah, are. Hannah, maybe you can now put the more specific ones. But the first one, um, the first two for the clearinghouse and the the project itself are in the chat already. Great. So what I'm showing you now is the clearinghouse itself, and this is our um, homepage, and uh, you can use um, a lot of features on the homepage to um, get at cases. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, but what I'm gonna to go to first is, is the report under special reports and then under this project. Um, and maybe I better put it in the chat actually. Uh, here. Um, so this is the project page for the effective communication paper. Now, the reason I'm showing you this page is not just so that you can go and download the same the same um, paper that we've uh, shared, but so that you can see what other resources are here. What's here is both the paper itself, um, which if you download it is screen readable, um, and there's also a large print version if you want to print it and read it that way, but also the resources down at the bottom of the page. And so I urge you, if you're um, involved in this kind of work, to check out those resources. What you will see if you click on it, and again, I'm going to put the click in the chat. This is a folder of um, information that may be relevant to you if you are interested in effective communication with um, deaf or blind people behind bars. It includes um, uh, all of the all of the Department of Corrections policies that are referenced in the clearing in the in the paper in one folder. A fifty state um, a 50 state run on all of the state prison disability policies as of 2018, that one's a little out of date. Um, and most important, a word processing version of the model policies so that if you want to crib from them, you easily can. All you have to do is open it up and there it is and you can cut and paste at will. So um, 
So that's the first thing that I wanted to show you. The second thing that I wanted to show you was just to talk about how did we arrive at the document that we're about to spend the rest of the time in this webinar discussing. Um, and so the, the process here was that we began with the litigations, um, and there are many. Um, we've collected 65 or 69, 68 cases. They're here. Um, wait, I better put that in the chat again for people who can't see it. Um, we collected up the 68, they're almost all class actions. Um, although you can see at the top, there's there's one that never got filed in court at all. It's just a Justice Department um, a settlement. But they're, they're basically class actions involving deaf or blind prisoners. And we collected them, we read their settlements, we read their pleadings, and um, we learned from them. That was step one. Step two was gathering up experts um, from a variety of perspectives around the country, lawyers, um, affected family members, people who have done consulting work on the issues, people who work in jails and prisons, and both interviewing them and then doing several focus groups where we talked to them both before and after there was a draft of the paper. Um, and so that was basically our process. And um, and we landed on the paper that we're sharing with you. So uh, the paper itself, if I think I'm going to stop sharing at this point, but the paper itself um, does a couple of things. Number one, it presents some some, uh, some information about the need for interventions in this area. Number two, it does a, a summary of the law that's applicable, the requirements of the ADA, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. And then number three, um, it presents a set of policy recommendations that are drafted not for people to read and then think about, I mean, of course you should read them and think about them, but not for people to read and mull over and think, I wonder how that could be reflected in policy language in a jail or a prison, but rather, set out in the format that jails and prisons tend to use for their policy documents. So the idea is that they're made there and they and they explore what we um, know from our own experience and what we learned from all of that consultation are the, the major issues. Um, so I think that's what I intended to, oh yes, one more thing and I have to share, I have to share screens. I skipped one thing, my apologies, just so that you, can see how to use the clearinghouse your own self. The clearinghouse is very searchable. So if you got interested in this or any other topic, you can search, as you can see me doing, you can search by case type. I'm gonna look for just prison cases. And then you could search for issues, for example, like maybe you want down here, um, maybe you want, um, you don't wanna limit yourself to, um, jail to, to deaf and blind issues, you want all disability issues, you could search for that. And then when you run that search, you'll get cases involving that set of issues. Um, there's also a text search. So suppose you wanted to do this same thing, but you only want cases that involve hepatitis. Text searching takes a little while, so I'm gonna talk through it as it does its thing, but eventually I'm going to get prison cases in which there's a disability claim that involves hepatitis. All right, it's it's a little too slow, and and I'm 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 antsy for us to get on to the to the meat of today's webinar. So I'll stop sharing. You'll just have to trust me that that would work. So I think I'll stop at that and turn the floor back over to Tessa. Although as I say, I'll I'll end up getting it back a little bit later. Um, uh, uh, for a presentation on the on the merits of all of this on um, communication with people who are deaf, blind, low hearing, low vision. Thanks. Thanks, Margo. So um, first, I've gotten a few questions in the chat directly, so I'll just respond to anybody who may be wondering. We will post this recording for those who are unable to attend. It'll be available on our website, um, and we'll send it out in our newsletter. Um, so for those who have asked, it will be available um, after this uh, publicly. Um, all right, so now on to the white paper recommendations. Um, we won't have time today to go over everything that we recommend in the white paper, but to get us 
to start um, to get us sort of thinking about it, um, I figured I'd start today with some of the broad principles that guided our approach to these policies and that um, over and over again, the advocates and folks that we talked to emphasized um, as necessary for meaningful policy reform in this area. So the first is the importance of being proactive and preparing in advance. So this means even before anyone who needs uh, these kinds of policies, anyone with a communications disability is in custody, uh, that you should, a jail and a prison should adopt policies and protocols um, along the lines of what we recommend in this paper. They should train staff on how to identify communication disabilities, what the law requires, what people may need, what's available um, in, in, uh, in the setting. Um, they should hire uh, experienced, qualified ADA coordinators, people who have experience working in the disability field and understand the requirements, not just of the law, but also uh, how, how to um, interface with community uh, organizations who, who may uh, be able to support here um, and, and where the resources are and how to track developments in innovations and technology in these areas. Along those lines, it's important, again, proactively to engage with the community organizations and resources that do exist, community-based service providers, training centers, centers for independent living that may be able to help develop um, resources that may be able to guide jails and prisons to what is available that may be able to help when someone um, comes into the jail and prison and needs, for example, training on how to use a white cane. Um, uh, it's also important uh, in preparing proactively to make sure that the facilities are set up, have the technologies, have the requisite um, video phones, caption telephones, tablets with screen readers, non-auditory alarms, the kinds of things that can't happen with a snap of fingers as soon as someone needs them, but must be available as soon as someone arrives. Um, and create accessible versions of all materials. So if there are orientation materials that are in written form, there should be sign language and captioned videos um, of those written materials, braille or electronic versions with the available assistive, assistive technology, screen reader, screen reading devices, et cetera, to make those materials accessible. All of that should happen before it's needed. Um, so these are among the things that we point to that should be happening proactively. Uh, it's also essential in um, when developing policy in this area um, and implementing policy to remember that there's no one size fits all solution, that uh, every policy um, or protocol that we recommend needs to be individuated and account for variation. The fact that people are differently abled, maybe multiply disabled, may have different needs from somebody who shares the same um, disability with them. So there's no one size fits all solution and both policy and practice needs to account for that. Um, along those lines, there should be uh, maxim choice should be maximized. So the person who um, the incarcerated person themselves should have um, as much choice and agency over uh, the uh, the accommodations and modifications, the auxiliary aids and services, the medical devices, um, et cetera, that are uh, that they end up using to facilitate effective communication and participation. Uh, primary consideration must be given on, <laughs> to the, their choices and it should be an ongoing and collaborative process to determine what meets the needs of, of each person on a person by person basis. Simil this requires similarly flexibility um, and continuous checking in. Uh, and as I said, continuous dialogue. And another reason for that is that a person's needs may change over time. What they needed the first day that they entered may be different than what they need a few months later. Um, and similarly, technology adapts. Um, so not only uh, may there be new interventions, devices, or technologies that could um, facilitate that could facilitate communication in a better way for a particular person. Um, it, it's essential. So, so for that reason, it's essential to keep checking in and to see is there something new that might um, that might be better serving you in this situation. And it's also important when developing policy to account for the fact that these technologies quickly change. Um, and so, as you'll see if you look through the white paper recommendations, although in many places we have given as examples specific technologies, we have also tried to write the policies in a way that accounts for the fact that these technologies may change and what is the um, 
you know, the best, <laughs> the best tool that we have today may not be the best tool that we have a year from now or two years from now. And policies both need to be flexible enough to account for that, but should also require that the jails and prisons are looking to new technologies, keeping abreast of what is available and making sure that um, that those new tools and technologies come into jails and prisons uh, as quickly as they are coming into the outside community. And so all of those guiding principles, uh, we have attempted to, uh, to write these policies with those in mind. Um, and, at, and now I will turn it back over to Margo to talk about the anti-discrimination principles from the law that similarly guided our approach here. Great, thanks. I'm now going to share screens again and use a slide. For those of you who on our request for accommodations form said that you needed the slide in advance, this is the slide deck that we already shared with you. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to share it on the screen. So uh, here we are. Whoops. Sorry. Here. So the um, the white paper starts as our thinking starts as um, on this matter, it starts with an idea about, well, hang on just one second. Come on. There we go. It starts with a set, a, a set of commitments to anti-discrimination principles. And these are, these are founded primarily on the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. But like those statutes, they also serve constitutional purposes of avoiding cruel and unusual punishment, avoiding deliberate indifference to serious needs, um, uh, serving due process and First Amendment um, ideas, all of which is sketched out. The most important commitment and the, the touchstone of everything is that jails and prisons need to make an overall commitment to equality that they, they need to take affirmative steps to avoid excluding prisoners with disabilities from equal access to services, programs, and activities. And that includes both by providing medical devices because prisons and jails provide medical care and um, disability-related medical care is no exception. They need to do that. They need to provide auxiliary aids and services um, screen readers, um, interpreters, uh, uh, telecom devices, and the like. Um, they need to do that, and they need to be um, to to um, look at and make reasonable modifications, which in this document we call reasonable modifications and accommodations, because some people are unfamiliar with the the phrase reasonable modification, and they're much more familiar with the phrase reasonable accommodation, and so we try to just name them both. They need to provide reasonable modifications to um, uh, otherwise applicable policies to avoid setting up barriers to equal access. And so that's the, the baseline level of commitment. And we run through a set of things that come up in jails and prisons. The one you'd think that we would go right from the overall commitment to equality right into sort of as lawyers, the theories of liability, right? No disparate treatment, reasonable modifications, effective communication. But we actually put in the very second place the idea that disability should not be punished because that looms so large as a problem in jails and prisons where somebody signs to communicate and all of a sudden they're being accused of gang membership or where somebody, um, doesn't hear an, uh, an order to stand up for count, and all of a sudden they're being punished for disobedience or for failure to present and the like, right? So no punishment of disability or its expression seemed to be important enough that we, we called it out. After that, this runs through the, um, for those of you who are lawyers, what will be the familiar fonts of liability under the ADA and 504, right? No disparate treatment, in other words, no saying as um, prisons I've had connection to have, uh, you know, that prisons that I've um, observed sometimes say no saying things like people who are deaf can't have um, jobs outside the walls, right? Those are very good jobs when you're in prison. They pay more um, or sometimes sometimes they, they earn more um, good time. No saying, well, if you have a disability, you can't have those. No disparate treatment. Reasonable modifications, if you have a rule, for example, that says that, I don't know, that people have to journal 
in order to participate in some kind of rehabilitative education. And you've got somebody who can't write because um, they're, they're blind and they're not being provided any, um, any uh, uh, implements that allow them to write, um, then you, you can't do that. That's, that's, you need a reasonable modification that allows them to journal in some other way. And effective communication, that communication with people who have communications disabilities like um, hearing or vision impairments or like being deaf or blind, that communication with those people has to be as effective as communication with people without those issues. Um, I think that's probably sufficient for this for this um, set of, of running through, although you can see there's a couple of other things in part one. And I need to ask um, Tessa if I'm supposed to do the next slide or if you want to. Um, I'm happy to do it. Do you mind keeping it up? Nope, there it is. So uh, as I mentioned, we're not gonna be able to get to everything today. So um, we decided to focus on one policy to give you an example of how some of those broader considerations that I talked about earlier informed the approach here and should inform an approach to policy reform in this area and also to show what one of the policies suggests. So this is policy 8.7, which, uh, requires non-auditory alarms, alerts, and emergency notifications. And you know, one thing that we had heard about happening is prisons have an alarm that sounds. And for the folks who aren't able to hear the alarm or the alert, they rely on an in-person, they may rely on an in-person notification system that can be much slower or not happen at all. Um, relies, you know, is susceptible to human error in a way that the um, alarm is not. Um, and so uh, that and other um, approaches, you know, don't uh, take the place of uh, in a, in the way that they must to be effective, um, the, the auditory alarms and alerts. So we have attempted to develop a policy here that does a better job of doing that. And so um, this policy, as you can see, uh, ha requires non-auditory systems for emer emergency notifications, for routine notifications that apply generally. So for example, it's mealtime, it's count time, and also for individual notifications, you know, and uh, something that might take the place of an announcement to a particular person telling them that they have a visitor, for example. And we have uh, suggested here some technologies from 2022 that would work. Um, so for example, um, it may be that you give people uh, you you give people vibrating pagers, or and you use those in conjunction with an electronic message board. Um, there may be bed shaking devices um, or visual and or visual alarms for an emergency notification. In addition to uh, vibrating pagers, again might work in that setting. Um, but we have uh, suggested these as appropriate devices now accounting for the fact that there may be developments that work better in the future. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, and we've, uh, so the policy also requires prompt repair and, and replacement of these devices. This is a common theme throughout. Um, you know, anything that someone's relying on to communicate and participate in a jail and prison, there can't be a delay if the thing breaks. Um, it needs to be both promptly repaired and also immediately replaced in the interim. Um, you know, any non-auditory alert should be visible from everywhere, um, should be a, uh, and should happen promptly, sort of at the same time and giving the same amount of notice as the auditory alerts do. Um, and you'll see in E, we reference the person-to-person -person systems as something that might supplement our recommendations but should not replace them. Um, and then finally, we require staff training on these systems, uh, which again is a theme throughout that staff need to understand what's available and how to use them, what to do if they break, what the policies and procedures are. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Robertson, uh, who's going to tell us about recent work that she's done in Colorado and uh, work that she's doing currently in Tennessee. Go ahead, Amy. Hi, everybody. Um... I'm Amy Robertson. I'm with a lawyer in a private firm, Fox and Robertson, here in Denver. Um, and I, first of all, I want to say I am extremely humbled both by my co-presenters and by the audience. The cool thing about um, oh, this kind of Zoom format is I can see the audience, and and um, I there's some amazing practitioners and others in the audience um, and experts. 
I, I also wanted to shout out to the Clearinghouse generally as a resource. Um, Margot gave you a, a quick tour, but it's just an unbelievable resource in the civil rights world. You know, you can't you can't get what you need from Westlaw, and it's incredibly expensive. You can't get you can't do a full text search in Pacer, and it's also pretty damn expensive. Um, this has search capability. It has um, full text search. It has the types of documents you won't find on either Westlaw or Pacer. Um, so big shout out to the Clearinghouse generally. Um, so as Tessa mentioned, we're working on a couple of cases currently. Um, we ended up settling um, coincidentally, sort of simultaneously, two cases against the Colorado Department of Corrections. Um, one is uh, called Maccus versus Colorado Department of Corrections, addressing concerns of blind and low vision incarcerated people. And in that case, we represented two blind men, as well as the National Federation of the Blind of Colorado. Um, and we also recently settled <clears throat> uh, Disability Law Colorado versus CDOC, which addressed the concerns of deaf and hard of hearing incarcerated people. Um, and there we had only our organizational plaintiff, um, the Colorado Protection and Advocacy System, uh, Disability Law Colorado, although we worked with um, around 20 different um, deaf and hard of hearing incarcerated people who were the constituents of, of DLC and provided <clears throat> really invaluable input um, and uh, on in both the complaint and the settlement. And then we're now working with the Tennessee PNA um, uh, called Disability Rights Tennessee in a case called Disability Rights Tennessee versus the Tennessee Department of Correction. And that again is addressing the concerns of deaf and hard of hearing incarcerated people um, we have both the organizational plaintiff and a number of both deaf and hard of hearing plaintiffs, individuals, and that case is currently in discovery um, with just the beginnings of some um, exploration of settlement, uh, which is making this white paper really, really useful right about now. Um, but I wanted to talk, I, I'm going to kind of say, talk to some of the same things Tessa did, but from the perspective of a practitioner. Um, the, both Tessa, I think, and Margo talked about um, the fact that there, there are a lot of amazing settlements. People have been doing these cases, you know, heroically for years um, and have settled and gotten some great terms, but, but the, um, te the technology moves fast. And, you know, these cases, it, I mean, it's, this is true in a lot of areas of law, but these are very focused um, on both the avail the, the 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 progress of the law um, in in recognizing rights, but also um, the progress of technology. Um, and, and just by way of example, we we did an earlier case. We took on video phones as a standalone issue in Colorado, based on a case that had been originally brought pro se. But as we were researching that, you know, there were a number of cases where that they settled where the goal was let's get TTYs in the prison. And there were decisions where the where courts held, you know, believing themselves to be really enforcing this law. Darn it, you really need to provide TTYs. And of course, by the time we got to our case, um, video phones were universal in the community. Um, almost no one in the community has a TTY. Um, because the video phones had, had really supplanted TTYs, they were almost useless. And, and then, you know, they've always had limitations for people whose first language is not English. You know, for some reason in prisons, they just never seem to work very well. So we kind of, we had a little bit of a headwind with these cases saying, yay, TTYs. Um, but uh, we did manage to convince the court um, with the assistance of our, uh, our excellent expert, Richard Ray, who I think is on this call, hey, Richard, um, that in fact, the current technology is video phones and ended up getting a summary judgment decision in favor, granting summary judgment to plaintiffs on video phones. Um, but what the, what makes this white paper so useful is it, it draws from these earlier settlements, but, but evolves the technology. So some of the, the good language from the settlements, some of the good implementation, some of the um, good policies are there, but it provides, um, it focuses on up-to-date technology. Um, and I really found this to be, I was, 
sort of honored to be consulted, one of the people consulted on this, and ended up in a little bit of a feedback loop in that I was consulting on this white paper at the same time that we were negotiating settlement in both Macus and the DLC case. So I would sort of try to reflect our experience into my comments. Um, and then I'd see a new draft and see other people's input and other people's comments, which I could then take back to our, our litigation teams and try to get into our settlements. Um, now, at, as we start to explore potentially a settlement in disability rights in the Tennessee case, and, and as we're continuing to litigate it, crafting discovery, working with experts, it's, a, it's an amazing resource um, in, in that respect to, to just guide those, all of those processes. We've, um, I wanna shout out to the, um, especially the word processing version because um, the clearinghouse folks made plagiarizing really easy Lots of um, blocking and, and copying and pasting uh, went on as we started to think about settlement. Um, but I want to back up and say uh, that there are a lot of stages at which I think this is this resource is is important. As Tessa stressed, it's 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 important to facilities that are trying to comply with the law. And you know, really, obviously, the best way to ensure effective communication in prison is just to go ahead and provide it without waiting to be sued. Um, and so I, I think this is a, um, a resource for prison administrators, for ADA coordinators to kind of see the, the best practices and the, and the language that could be useful. Um, it's, it's helpful. I think it's going to be helpful at every stage of litigation. Um, you know, the, the most important part of litigation like this is working with uh, affected clients. So, you know, you start with a conversation with incarcerated people who are facing um, these violations of the ADA, lack of effective communication. Um, and I, I think being able to have those conversations, you know, knowing, having internalized, having reference to these policies and best practices um, gives you a way to talk about it with your clients, um, gives you a way to talk about the up-to-date technology. Um, we've worked with a number of people who've been incarcerated so long, they really weren't aware of the latest in, in um, technology available. Um, and it also frames the discussion around what's possible in, in court, I think. Um, I, it would be uh, it, amazing at the investigation stage and the, and the point where you're considering litigation. We always start with a demand letter. Um, and often the first response is, no, we're complying with the law, go away. But the second response is often, okay, then what do you want us to do? Um, and even though it's not you know, it's not our clients, it's not our responsibility, you know, to, to make Title II compliance happen, that the, the facilities should be doing that on their own with all due respect. But it would have been great at, in each of these cases at that demand letter stage where they say, what do you want us to do to say, here, this is what we'd like you to do um, and have a kind of ready-made um, set of policies that could jumpstart that discussion. Um, and then it's, again, uh, it is. It has been in the in the Colorado cases and and will be in Tennessee. Um, amazing uh, during the settlement process to have these, um, you know, best practices to see what other people are doing um, and you know that how that information is filtered into this white paper. So um, that is, I guess, that's my uh, perspective as a general matter from the litigation front. Um, happy to talk about that and also any of the specifics of the of the settlements that we just entered into Macus and DLC um, but I'll I'll shut up for now and let the uh, organizer turn it back over to comments and questions thank you all thanks so much Amy so we're going to start the more interactive part now um, and I invite you all to put um, comments and questions into the chat and Margo's going to take over for me in one second but while you are thinking about questions and typing them in, I would be remiss not to emphasize what a collaborative effort this was to, to develop these recommendations. Amy alluded to her own um, role. It, hers was a crucial role um, in helping guide these recommendations. I see many other familiar faces here today. So um, I do want to emphasize and thank those of you who are here today that this was a really collaborative process and we relied heavily on people with experience um, on these issues as attorneys and advocates and experts in the field in developing the recommendations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Margo. Great, thanks so much. 
I want to do a particular thanks to, to the National Association for the Deaf and the National Federation for the Blind, um, of the Blind, um, uh, which, which played a particularly helpful back and forth role with us. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit riffing while people put things into the chat. So this is your time to put things into the chat. But, um, but one other thing is in our future, which is that we're going to create a know your rights document out of all of this. And so I see so many fantastic advocates and also people who are involved in jails and prisons in other ways. If anybody has feedback for that or wants to be involved in distributing it or helping do it or whatever, they can um, send us something that says that. You can email Tessa, whose email you all have because she's been the, the voice of this webinar. Or you can email info at clearinghouse.net. Um, and say, hey, I want to I want to be part of that creation of a know your rights document, which we're then going to distribute to people. Um, we're also going to make the the all of these white papers available behind bars by way of Lexis, which I'm kind of excited about. So for places that whose law libraries have a Lexis contract, which is a lot of them, it turns out, it'll be freely available by by that web method. OK, so now there are some questions. Um, so. Uh, Charlie asks whether or not the first step is to hire a disabilities coordinator. And you're right, you, you must have missed it because it was the very first thing that Tessa said. Good point. Um, you talk fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Amy, there's a question for you, which is about PLRA exhaustion. Um, I feel like P the, the PLRA has, um, it's been like a constant in my career. So I love this question. But the question is um, from Courtney Holthus. Uh, how does the PLRA come into play when the prison is not following its grievance procedure? Um, you could answer that. I can answer that, whichever you prefer. Uh, I'm going to let you answer from the, because I think you are much more an expert in the PLRA itself. And that question really is a PLRA question rather than a yep. ADA. I will say two quick things. One is I can't say enough about organizational plaintiffs because um, there is good law out there that organizational plaintiffs do not have an exhaustion requirement, and our partners, um, uh, Disability Law, uh, Disability Rights Tennessee, Disability Law Colorado, and the National Federation of the Blind of Colorado helped us just blow right past that exhaustion requirement. Um, we're, we also have gotten some traction, although it, this ended up, uh, the case ended up being settled on the question of, of of grievance processes that are specifically inaccessible to people with communication disabilities, which is different from, I think, the question, which is just the prison dropping the ball. So I think it's worth exploring with clients who have communication disabilities, whether those disabilities have made it or lack of accommodation has made it impossible to grieve. Um, and I wanna come back, I had got a direct question. So after, Margo, after you talk about the PLRA, I wanna come back to that. Great, we'll come back to you. So. The, under under Ross versus Blake, the, the Supreme Court has said that the PLRA, when it says that prisoners have to exhaust available remedies, that it means that they have to be available. Remedies can be unavailable for, the court says, three, although there's no sign that these are exhaustive, but three reasons. And um, if they're a dead end, if nobody can figure out how to use them, or, um, crap. I'm actually blanking on the way they phrased the third one, which is embarrassing, but the basic point is that they have to be unavailable. So um, when somebody files a grievance and they get no answer, the question is, for one thing, they may have exhausted. Because they got no answer, they may be done. It depends on how the grievance policy is written. If the grievance policy requires them, if they get no answer, to nonetheless seek appeal, then that's what they have to do. If it says they have to wait for an answer and they never get an answer, then they're done, not because it's unavailable, but because they're done. If the grievance policy, if the grievance procedure is unavailable because somebody takes all the grievances and throws them in the waste paper basket, or because um, a person who's blind is required to use a kiosk that doesn't have a screen reader, or you know, there's a thousand ways in which the process could be unavailable, then under Ross versus Blake, it is unavailable and exhaustion um, the exhaustion requirement, is, it's not that it's waived, it's that it has no application because exhaustion is only to use available grievance procedures. So hopefully that helps. Um, and I should just say, um, perhaps many people here know, but John Boston, um, who uh, is the guru of all things PLRA, has um, available on Kindle, uh, you know, available as an ebook or as a hard copy book, 
a, a treatise about the PLRA whose, whose footnotes are as close to exhaustive as one can imagine um, in the year that they were written, which as it happens was this year. So um, it is possible that will grow out of date someday, but it's not out of date now. And I urge everybody to reference it. There's um, last time I looked like 300 pages on exhaustion in their footnotes for every possible thing you could imagine so that you can cite authority for, your, for the side you're taking and know the authority against you. Okay, so Amy, the floor is yours. So just a quick note, I got a, a direct uh, message question um, saying that uh, one facility had provided braille machines but had not provided training for the inmates. So the effect is that the machines are useless. And I can't stress that enough that, that, what, that the technology has to come with training, not only of staff, but of, of the incarcerated people who need to use it. Um, we had initially um, on, in our Maccus case, uh, before we got involved, our client, uh, Mr. Maccus had requested a screen, screen reading program. And so they installed JAWS on one uh, computer in the library and then refused to provide him training. He kept requesting training and they said, you, you wanted screen reading program, we gave you a screen reading program, go have fun. Um, and it was utterly useless. So uh, part of any settlement, part of any negotiation needs to be provide the technology and provide the training to our clients. Great. Um, uh, Michelle has the question uh, that since prisons are starting to use scans of um, mail and then send electronic copies to prison mail rooms, and the question is how has that dis impacted disabled folks behind bars? And my instinct is that sometimes that actually might even be good because you could end up with things that are available on screen in places that have screen readers that might actually be good. On the other hand, most places don't have screen readers. And so that ends up being um, very bad because you have a, an electronic document that, um, that somebody can't read. However, they probably couldn't have read it in hard copy either. So I'm not sure that disability access is the right way to think about this change. Now, at this point, because there are so many experts here who are closer, and maybe some of them have observed this more closely than me, I actually wanna ask if somebody, if somebody has more experience on this, um, pro or con, maybe they can like unmute yourself and speak up. I'm just going to add real quick that one of the things we fought hard for in our Maccus case was to get scanners. Now, they're, you know, the Colorado Department of Corrections has not moved to full scanning, um, but we now have, our, our clients now have in their day hall what's called a SARA scanner. And to the extent they have something that is, um, you know, more or less screen readable, that's typed rather than handwritten, uh, they can put the document uh, under the SARA scanner and, and it will be read to them. So that feature, like Margot said, can be really useful. All right. Is there anybody out of everybody here? You, I can't see raised hands. I suppose you can use the raised hand, the raised hand function of um, uh, the raised hand function of Zoom if you want to raise your hand. But if you're just raising your hand like this, I'm not going to be able to see it. Nobody. Okay. So we'll just make do. Yeah. So TL says that incarcerated folks have been fighting against their mail not being sent to directly to them. And that's absolutely true. Um, and I don't think they've had a lot of success in that yet, but it's early days yet. Um, so we'll see what happens. What I'm not aware of is, is, is this a, a different or worse problem for people with communications disabilities than for other people? Um, TL, if you have any insight into that. Uh, and Roxanne says it furthers the isolation people experience. Fair enough, fair enough. So, okay, um, other questions or we've got 10 minutes left. If there are people who want to speak to kind of next steps, things they wish we would do, things you'd like to do with, with all of this to open the, the to open the, it's, it's a little complicated. We've got 92 people here, um, but we'll, we'll try it and see if things get too chaotic. Does anybody? want to, you know, kind of raise their hand to have a conversation, or if anybody has any additional questions, just put them in the chat. I'm a little tempted to riff while this happens. So let me just say that in some ways, the litigation has focused 
extremely on telecommunications. There's been, there's been more telecommunications litigation than anything. And, and with a lot of emphasis on um, video phones uh, for people who sign to communicate. And I think that is extraordinarily important to avoid um, isolation of people who sign to communicate. So I don't mean to, I don't mean to knock that litigation at all. I do think that there is room for that what hasn't been litigated so much um, and there's room for a lot of improvement is things for people who are hard of hearing as opposed to deaf and sign and even in telecommunications. So that captioned telephones, which are a really good technology have been underutilized extraordinarily behind bars um, even more than video phones. And that's a technology that for people who don't sign, um, who can speak but don't hear very well, that's a technology that can really transform their ability to connect with their loved ones while they are behind bars. Um, and so we've really tried hard in this white paper to take account of both the capital D deaf and also um, people whose um, disabilities are perhaps later acquired or um, a little bit more on a, on a scale um, than that. Amy, it looks like you had something that you wanted to say. I was gonna say, I think this is a good example in some ways of, of really recent technology and also a technology that's, that's not necessarily very well known outside of prison um, and that is most useful for a population that, like you said, is not capital D deaf, not part of deaf culture, um, loses hearing over time, often loses, people lose their hearing in prison um, and they're simply not aware it exists. So, so our um, Colorado settlement requires caption telephones and also requires cap, you know, the availability of remote captioning. And both of those technologies were sort of a surprise uh, to our clients. They were very glad to have it, um, but didn't know to ask for it. Um, so I think that's another, to the extent that this is right there in the white paper, another huge service that the white paper does. Right. Uh, oh, let me just say one thing, Tessa. Yeah, go for it. At the same time, one has to be super careful when you're talking about any population of people, there's gonna be a lot of varying um, degrees of familiarity with, with text. Um, and I used to ask, I, I've, I, I monitored for five years, I monitored the Kentucky settlement of, it was a, a big deaf, um, it was a system-wide case about deaf and hard of hearing. And everybody I talked to, which was probably, I mean, we did hundreds of interviews, Everybody we talked to ever, we'd say, you know, can you read? And they generally speaking said, oh yeah, I can read. But when I said, well, can you read the newspaper or can you read captioning fast enough to follow it on television? Oftentimes the answer to that was no. And for people in that situation, cap tells, caption telephones are not such a great solution because they don't read quickly enough. Um, so, okay, uh, Tessa. Um, I have a two part uh, question <laughs> and I'm going to invite, I suppose, Margo and Amy to answer it first and also others to jump in. So lest we present this as implement these policies and everything will be wonderful. Um, I'm curious, Amy, how you approach the post settlement piece and any strategies um, that either of you, you know, Margo in your monitoring work or Amy um, in your litigation work have observed that can help um, promote compliance with the settlement agreement. Um, and then the second piece of that, that I, I'm really extending to anybody on the call who wants to share thoughts in the chat or, um, or you know, speaking or signing, um, is how uh, some of these reforms may be implemented outside of litigation and thoughts on what a strategy or approach in that context might look like. Great, Amy, you wanna start? Um, sure. I, um, all of our uh, settlement agreements, including back to the video phone case, had um, monitoring provisions, uh, monitoring and enforcement provisions. We, we never ended up having to go to court to enforce it. We did have a lot of, um, especially with the video phones, we just sort of had technical glitches in, initially that we had to work out. Um, but I think we were lucky, and I, I, I know there's some Coloradans on this call who may um, kick me later, but um, I think we have seen an evolution in the um, 
knowledge and approach of the of Colorado's ADA coordinator, to be totally honest. And it's somebody that we have worked with in a variety of capacities over perhaps 10 years. Um, and I can say it's um, the knowledge and attitude has definitely evolved um, to the point where in, in, the, in talking about settlement in Macus and the DLC case, um, she was very, she was proactive in suggesting uh, technological solutions in researching the things that we asked her to do. So in implementing the VP case, it's, they've been very um, quick to respond and fix problems, probably not as proactive in finding problems as I'd like. Um, but I think it, when you're settling, I think it is incredibly important to have you know, detailed provisions in the settlement and a detailed kind of monitoring and enforcement provision. Um, we always have two steps so that we're not going right back to court. I'm sure most people do this in their consent decrees and settlements um, so that you have this opportunity to meet and confer and try to solve the problem at, at the lowest level before you get the court involved. Great. So, um, uh, Carolyn, I'll, I'll call on you in one second. Um, uh, I think that one of the ways to get jails and prisons to do ADA compliance without a lawsuit is to make it as easy as possible. Um, I think that's important. I don't think it's the job of non-administrators to make it as easy as possible, but I think it helps. That actually was motivational for this white paper. Like part of the idea was not only to use to do it as a go-by for people litigating, but to use it as a go-by for people who are behind bars, um, both people who live behind bars and people who work behind bars. So, so the idea was to make it as easy as possible. I also think that one wants to think at all times about making um, as many steps as possible uh, uh, auditable. So that if an institution has some interest in figuring out if it's happening, that they actually have the ability to do that. So for example, some of this could be very simple. You can put a piece of paper on top of the, um, of the video remote interpretation laptops, which people use, that says they have to be lo logged out. And if you look after a month and they've never been logged out, well, then that suggests that people are not using them the way they should. And so you've, you've built in an automatic audible auditableness, which is helpful. Um, okay, so we've got two minutes before we promise to be done. And we have two questions on the table. One is from Charlie um, uh, from Cure. And he says, uh, he, taught, he wants to know about ADA coordinators, if it's really important that they have a disability and how many of them do. And I would say this, I'm very much in favor of people with disabilities um, working in jails and prisons, but ADA coordinators have to deal with pan disability issues. And if I was picking it as representation, I don't know which one I'd pick, honestly, right? Would they be deaf? Would they be blind? Would they have a mobility impairment? Would they have asthma? I, I, don't, I don't know. So, so I would say it's important for jails and prisons to hire people with disabilities in general, but um, the ADA coordinator, what the ADA coordinator really needs is um, uh, uh, knowledge and um, stick to itiveness and gumption. And those, those seem to me to be the really important things. And lots of people with disabilities have those and lots of people without disabilities have those. And that, that seems to me now, maybe I'm being, I don't know, maybe I'm not being aggressive enough. I'm not sure. Um, uh, Carolyn, you get the last question or comment and then we'll close out. Uh, you're on mute. Oh, you're signing. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just want Charlie, 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 Caroline is signing. Okay, who I am? Charlie Sullivan with Q. Wait, 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 Charlie. I need to. I need to ask you not to go yet. I. Uh, it's. It's. Caroline is up and she's signing. Okay, just give. Okay. Just give us a minute. Um, is the interpreter interpreting for Caroline? There you go. Uh, so related to the ADA coordinator question, I was trying to find information in the regs, but I think it's important that the ADA coordinator knows what they're doing. And I think that some information in the regs about the person should be knowledgeable, um, 
something to that point, but I can't find that specific information in there. But I think it's important to emphasize that um, in your work, the ADA coordinator takes training to become knowledgeable and that they should have power in the prison itself. So someone who is in a higher, more administrative position, for example. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Great. Um, I'll, I, I'm not gonna be able to point you to where this is in the ADA reg off the top of my head, but in our white paper, it's um, policy 11.1. .1. And so I direct you to that and maybe that helps a little bit. Um, I feel bad that I cut Charlie off. So let's give him the last, the last word before we really close out. And my apologies to people, we're gonna end up being like two minutes late. Charlie, go ahead. Uh, now you need to unmute. All right, this, this may not work. Can you unmute? You're still muted. Yeah. There you go. I, I would just say, I thought the white paper recommended that uh, uh, that they, uh, someone with a disability be hired. Uh, but while I have a, a chance, I'd like to say, and I hope that, I was surprised to hear that speech patterns were also included. Um, and of course we have the example of the president with the stutter. I, I, I grew up uh, and I, I think, maybe I still have it, but I was tongue tied. And um, I think there are many, many people who have that disability who are incarcerated. And I think it's something that maybe further uh, presentations, uh, I look forward to hearing about. Uh, and, and you included speech in the, in the white paper, if I remember correctly. Right, thank you so much. All right, I think we better close out since we promised to be done at two and it's 2.02. Um, I wanna again, thank everybody for being with us. Um, we will post this, um, this webinar as a, a, as a video if you have any colleagues who you think might be able to see it. And, um, and I urge you to both use the white paper, use the clearinghouse and to be in touch with us if you'd like to be involved in the know your rights piece of things or in any other way. And to be in touch with us, the best way is to do that at info at clearinghouse. Dot net um, because that goes to lots of lots of folks. Um, uh, so I think with that I will will turn off the recording um, and 